thank you. <clears throat> right. Uh, before we start off, any questions from yesterday's session? We saw about uh, extended star schema and star schema, right? So, any questions to that? Jina, Jyotsna, <coughs> Rajiv, Sheikh. Yeah, I had uh, uh, Emmanuel. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just typed a question, but I think I only sent it to Ravi. Uh, I just wanted to double check, like, um, um, so extended star schema and snowflake schema? What's the main difference between these two? Yeah. Like, is it Snowflake schema, extended star schema also? No. <coughs> uh, it's a little different. The Snowflake schema is a fact table to fact table connection. Fact table to fact table connection? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because on in the relational world we don't actually join fact table. You have a second fact table as well, and then you would have uh, the mass data available. <coughs> oh, to that fact table. Okay, so it's basically basically yeah. Snowflake is the multi multi fact star schema. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> we've seen about uh, the extended star schema. Uh, we've seen what is a star schema basically, and what are the disadvantages with the star schema. How these are connected with the extended star schema. We've seen that part of it, right? <clears throat> okay, just a second. Um, yeah, there is a dormitory problem with the server. Uh, so, there's somebody working on that. The server guy, he said he should be uh, able to fix it by Monday. So, in case you have any issues during that time, uh, just uh, be a little patient and you should have that connection fixed. All right. Uh, specifically to, I think, <coughs> Rajiv who has a little problem. So they asked me to address this to you. All right. <coughs> Uh, somebody want to just uh, brief us about uh, the disadvantages of star schema? Can't have more than um, 16 um, mass data tables inside the cube structure and uh, um, another one. 
I think they are not reusable, right? In the they cannot be reused in the uh, in the fact file again. What what cannot be reused? The mass data cannot be reused. Okay. Then? Performance problem because of the alphanumeric um, field joining. All right. <coughs> All right. So uh, you have the reusability issue. You have, uh, you have uh, the performance issue because of alphanumeric. And it is. It's also slow or something. That. Okay. Uh, don't be. <coughs> not too sure about it, but be clear about it, all right? One is the reusability, okay, which is mass data is not reused and it is stored redundantly in the star schema inside the queue. Then the second one is uh, the fact table consists of alphanumeric values because of which the performance is degraded and because you have less number of dimensions, your analysis is limited, okay? Because these are questions that uh, you will have during interviews, all right? Be clear about them. Don't uh, give generic answers like something. This could be something, all right? Be specific about what you know. <coughs> how are these uh, rectified or how are these overcome in the extended star schema? Uh, the master data tables are outside of the cube structure. Um, the SID table, which is created for um, for field and mass data, are, is actually connected to the internal dimension table. That could have um, um, about 248. Um, um, that internal dimension table is actually connected to the fact table. Right. Why does the dimension table have 248 connections? Why? Yeah. Because it could uh, because uh, the table could store about two hundred fifty five columns. That's the restriction. And seven of them are seven columns are restricted for um, SAP use. I guess. So you have 0 to 255, one of them is the dimension key, six of them are reserved for SAP and the remaining 248 can oh, accommodate 248 SID tables, which is connected to 248 mass data tables. Yes. All right, so out of that, so you, you were able to uh, bring the analysis to 13 times 248. What about performance? Um, so it's it's on the SIDs, so it's not alphanumeric anymore. Um, so it's uh, it's kind of like indexing those tables. So it goes through the numeric numbers faster than the alphanumeric for the scanning. All right. So let's go ahead and create an info cube. So, uh, Emmanuel, I created the step-by-step -step document uh, with all the just the steps. Should I send it to you? Yeah, you cc it on to me. Uh, you you have Ravi's email ID as well, right? Uh, Ravi Adikonda at technosins.com. Yeah, send it to him as well. He would be uh, able to send it to everybody else. Okay. Do you have his email address, Ravi's? If you just yeah, uh, Ravi Shankar, your, right? Yes. Yeah. Ravi, yeah, Ravi dot uh, that kind of, yeah.
No, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, I I I work in business objects, so I mostly work on the front end. And, um, mm -hmm. um, so, for example, in business objects, when we are creating a universe, I mean, we generally follow two routes. Either, um, um, so there's a there's a uh, there's a logical diagram, or there's a ER diagram that would, that would show you what tables and joins and relationship types um, that are needed. Or, um, you know, they give you a list of what they want. I mean, the, what the tables and the relationship types or cardinalities are. Uh, the third might be probably reverse engineering based off of, uh, you know, whatever SQL the report. Probably the transactional system to get the data, right? So, in in modeling over here, before they start the modeling, um, is 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 there any sort of uh, sort of information based off of like you know what uh, tables from the source system and joins and relationship types they should include or they have to understand the business and, and maybe guess the joins and uh, and the relationship types. Do you understand what I mean? I guess the first thing is uh, you would uh, definitely need uh, help from a functional guy when you're dealing with uh, BW uh, relating to the uh, I mean based on the relationship between different objects that you're trying to include into a cube and the joins that are necessary apart from that uh, again if that will be a critical one you will definitely need that help if not you usually can uh, specify the joins uh, your major uh, decision making will be as to what uh, objects you should be placing in each dimension. So if you are able to go ahead and conclude on that, uh, then you're pretty much your design is pretty much uh, defined. So <coughs> yeah, so I understand the point you're trying to make there. Uh, as to how exactly do you go ahead and design is uh, the background stuff that you're trying to ask, right? So at least we know that the the, the logical design is right. I mean, if, if the design is right, then you know um, the front end data will look good. But how do we double check in case like if, if there is some unsurety? Um, and in case we don't get like uh, the requirement based off of like what what type of mm -hmm. so <clears throat> whenever you're defining an info cube, so you have a lot of things that you'll have to uh, look at. First thing, you're looking also at the report that you finally have to generate. So they give you a format of the report, all right? So. When you look at the report, so you should be able to generate that data from the transaction data that you get from the info queue. Apart from that, you will also have to see a little bigger picture as to uh, what other fields can also be included when you are finally uh, loading your report from BW. So you might have some 20 or 30 fields in your report, but uh, probably uh, a year down the line, they might ask you for additional information on that report. So you should be able to see that before you actually create the cube. Because once you create a cube, you don't go ahead and keep adding objects or inf objects to that cube. That doesn't usually happen. You have to decide on that design and usually that is what will stay on. Or else you'll have to create a new one. <coughs> so uh, you have to look at these options that, okay, uh, this information also might be needed for this particular report. So you should be, you might not use it at this moment, but uh, it's always better you have that information as well because later on when people ask you to go ahead and add these fields, it's not an easy process if in case there is a cube and then you want to add another extra uh, key field or an extra info object to it, it is not an easy process. You will have to match it with the entire data that's already existing. You'll have to delete data from there. 
So there is a lot of cumbersome process involved. At least with 7.3 you have that relaxed a little bit. But with 3.5 and 7.0 you have to delete the data before you make any modifications to the info queue. So uh, you'll have to look at that as well. Uh, but your major stuff will be going backwards where uh, you have your report format and based on that you understand what are usually the stuff that you would need. Uh, the How would you derive that data uh, from a queue? Uh, is it just from the fact table or is it the way you connect your uh, master data tables and what kind of analysis might happen on that particular report? Uh, based on these, you define uh, what could be your mass data objects, what could be your transaction data objects, and from where <coughs> these data can come. So if you're looking at that data, you understand what would be your base tables. So based on the base tables, do you already have an extractor? Do you have to create an extractor? So you define that. Then later on, you would bring that data here. Does that extractor have the concept of extracting daily data, meaning delta capability, or is it just uh, always full load? So you'll have to look at all those options, and then you should be able to create. <coughs> all right? Yeah, so yesterday we saw that, I mean, I know it was a very basic example, but um, yesterday we saw, like, you know, so if you have a customer master data table, so it created, like, a customer key, there was a... I mean, the SID customer key, which was in turn um, connected to the internal dimension table, right? Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so, for example, the customer, so in order to get the unique result, if from the customer table, let's say it's not only the customer ID, there has to be like a, I don't know, it, it needs to be joined on the date also. Just just an okay. example. So mm -hmm. how, 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 does, how does that work? It creates another key for the date. In the internal dimension table, I mean, I don't know if I if I was very clear about my question. I'm just trying to understand that. I don't know if it makes sense very much. So you want to get one unique row when you're uh, referring to your transaction data, is it? it? Isn't that the case? For example, if I if I if I if I want to get all region result, then I'm looking for aggregated result for all regions, right? And if I want to get like um, north region and some city then it's a unique result, right? So so there is no duplication in data. So that's how we do our modeling, right? So for, for ev or, or create a queue for every combination of results, we get one row. So it's always that your primary key combination will be such a way that you would be only referencing one row at a time. Hmm. All right, that is a good design. So if you are able to pull up duplicate uh, stuff, then it means that there's something wrong with the design. Okay. So that is like our you, starting you could, application you could in, has to be joined on Yeah, the you, could, you could include your date columns, you could include anything for that matter. Okay. Make sure that you have that, that uh, key that you generate out of it uh, is able to pull up uh, just one single row. Okay, so that is the thing. We, for, for every combination of results, we need to have a single row. If it's not, then we go and check what else it needs to be joined on to get the unique result, right? If, if I'm right, this is like the there are <coughs> There are, see, even though you've, you're uh, loading uh, with the date key later on, <coughs> uh, when you, when you uh, load the request into the cube, you find that request also is a part of the primary key. So because of which, in case you're not compressing the cube, you'll find that the row will keep repeating whenever uh, you're, do, you're querying on a particular info queue because the uh, request also is a part of the primary key. But once you have a concept of compression where you are suppressing the request number and whatever other primary keys, all of them get, uh, the ones that have the same primary key, all of them get suppressed then you will find that there's one single row of data for a particular combination of your primary keys. If not, you will find multiple uh, rows unless you take out the request number from your report. Okay. Are we going to do this because I really didn't understand anything? 
Yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. So whenever you load data into a cube, you'll find request numbers added. So uh, that will keep your rows uh, because of which whenever you are extracting, let's say you're trying to bring a customer number and saying, okay, pull me up these rows. So you would have data coming in from today, from yesterday, from previous day, all of those individually if you're having request number as a part of your primary key. But when you go ahead and compress a cube, that's when you're, uh, you will be having only one row per one uh, primary key combination. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Cool. <clears throat> so, um, your info area, so we're trying to go and uh, create a very basic cube. So, I click on your info area and say create an info cube. So, we have, have a standard cube that we're creating. So if you look at it, <coughs> this is the screen that you get for creation of the info cube. All right. So you have your settings, you have dimensions. I told you three of these dimensions are occupied by SAP. Right of those, out of those sixteen dimensions, you see the unit dimension, the time dimension, and data package dimension. These are already created. You don't, really don't have an option to take them off. The next one is the dimension one that you have. Uh, and that you can change the name. So let's uh, I want to go ahead and change this to customer dimension. Okay, and I also want to add one more dimension called material dimension. Now, <clears throat> I've created a customer dimension, I've created a material dimension. So how do I add uh, the mass data to this particular dimension? How do I mention that they should be joined uh, to this particular mass data? So if you go on to this uh, top here, you'd find something called as the info object catalog. So if I click on the info object catalog, I will be able to pull up the catalog relating to this particular info area. So I go and click on the characteristics and I find uh, in my catalog there is <coughs> customer number and material number. So what I do is I go ahead and drag my customer number into my customer dimension. So if I drop this, I'll find the customer number added to my dimension. And similarly, if I drag in my material, my material will be added to that dimension. All right. Able to follow? All right. So now if I want to add key figures, well, let's say I go and drag the keys. Any questions? 
can we can we pull up the catalogs from any info provider or just info provider that we are creating? Info provider or info area? I'm sorry, info area, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the system will automatically pull up the info area to your I mean specific to the one that you're working on. Or if you want, <clears throat> let's say I want to pick up something from Emmanuel, is this the info area we created in the class uh, session 2 and session 3? This 831? Mm -hmm. uh, this, is, this is a different info area, but uh, yeah, you, you'd find the same thing there. Uh, this I'm key on, figures, uh, we didn't create any right? key figures. Hmm? I'm on a different uh, uh, server altogether. So let's say I click on this and say continue. So I'd have this catalog. So I can bring up whichever catalog I want. All right. But by default, the system will link me to my own info area. So I've changed this. <coughs> So I have to go and connect it back to my info area. So by default it will use to bring that. I don't know what I've named that. All right, so somebody is saying we did not create the key figures, right? Uh, yeah, this is Chennai here. Uh, I don't remember creating a key figures. Can we create one? Yeah, sure, I will. Just activating the cube, I will go back and then create the key figures on the different server. Just give me one quick second. All right, so it says the cube has been created successfully. So you want to see the key figures, right? <laughs> Go into the info objects sub menu. <coughs> I have the catalog for key figures. I thought we created one called price, uh, which we will create another one. So we'll create one called the quantity. Okay, so when you create, <coughs> you have uh, this reference. What? This reference key figure is like if there's a there's already existing key figure and you just want to modify that. Is that what it is? Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Thank you. So let's say you already have a quantity uh, info object and you want to use its technical features. You want to copy it onto onto your actual. Uh, info object that you create, that's when you uh, go ahead and use the template. So, <coughs> defining a, a key figure called quantity, so you want to go ahead and create it as 
what what would you want the unit and the data type to be? So it should be a quantity one, so you can click on it. So whenever you say quantity, uh, the system will ask you to define either a fixed quantity or use a reference for quantity. So in, if you're dealing all of them with one single quantity, so you just go and say each or you can say just kgs or... So if there are multiple quantities or units that you would be giving for your quantity and some you might say grams and some you might say huh? Huh. and some you might say uh, uh, grams and some you might say kilograms and some uh, more than that and all that so if you and in case if you are referring uh, to many different kinds of units then it's always better you go and use uh, a reference one so because whenever you're dealing with reference, you would have the number and next to that you will also have the reference. Uh, the same applies even when you're talking about currency. So let's say that will be easier to explain. So your, uh, your uh, enterprise might be geographically located at different uh, places. And uh, you might be actually having to go ahead and do your transaction based on that local currency that you are in right now. So if you are in India, your transactions will be based in INR. In case you are in the US, USD, and if you are in uh, UK, you would be using GBPs. So <clears throat> all of these are different currencies, and you cannot have that same fixed currency of USD or INR. Uh, so what you would do is you would go ahead and give in a reference field of zero currency, add that as a part of your uh, info object. So wherever you're using that particular info object, even the reference goes along with it. And your uh, structure, you have to define both of them as well. So in case you're feeding data, you have to define both the fields together. It's always clinging on to that particular info object all the time. <coughs> all right, if you define the reference uh, unit of uh, currency or unit of measure. All right, so uh, that will help you uh, with the reference uh, unit of measure or currency that uh, you're dealing with. Later on, you could write a conversion routine. Let's say you're bringing that whole thing into one for cube at the end, and you really don't want to have different currencies. You want to have one currency, and over that, you'll be expressing your uh, reports. So in that scenario, you'll write a conversion routine for converting probably uh, INR to USD. So all of them, you want to go and deal with USD only. All your uh, reports uh, basically needs to show up everything in uh, IN, in USD. So you convert all the remaining currencies into uh, the USD currency before you actually push it into the info cube. All right. <coughs> so yeah, uh, you define the fixed unit of uh, measure as each and you can go and activate this. In case you want to go and create one for revenue. So this is the amount. So I'm giving a fixed currency of zero currency. Let's activate. So it says info object zero currency is not actively available. So let's go and activate that.
imagine the spell and there's a typo in that uh, it says c u u okay good Let's say you'd have currency always. What? Oh, okay, okay. This is um, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh, zero currency. What does this mean? Is this, is this a? What does this info uh, object? This, this is the reference info object that you used along. So oh, let's okay. say whenever. <coughs> so in case you're dealing with transaction data and somebody is pushing transaction data. And uh, there is Excel. So when you get data, you would have whenever you're dealing with uh, revenue. So in case there is some revenue data coming, so you have. <coughs> So you have always a reference of uh, currency. So you mention whether this could be INR. And this could be USD. It's more versatile now. So you can handle any currency, right? But later on, if you want to move this all to one currency, you can. But if you give USD, the system will take it only as one column, revenue as USD. Okay, so it will deal that all of these numeric is one uh, specific currency. So you don't mention anything as a currency here, right? I'm sure it is when we create the queue. So, <coughs> uh, so I've created the queue. Uh, if you see, I've created uh, material and customer and material as my uh, dimensions and then I have a unit dimension in which I have the currency key as well one of the key fields key figures have currency as a reference then I have three of these key figures as well uh, if I want to I can include a time uh, dimension I'm not including anything so I can go and check uh, if everything is consistent so it shows that the cube is consistent so now that I have the cube, all right. So the name of the cube is uh, info cube, and that is new, all right. Now this is the target that I have. I want to push data from my uh, Excel file. I need to create an Excel file with that data, with that kind of data, and then I need to push that data, all right. So I have uh, uh, a structure of. Uh, the data that is there, I call this is uh, the cube uh, data, I see underscore transaction data. So let me go and show you how my data is uh, that I need to push. I have customer number, material number, price. You have a reference uh, currency, which is USD. I have uh, the quantity field and the amount. So these are uh, our amount or revenue. So these are, uh, this is the structure of how the data is going to come, my transaction data. So I have to tell the system that, okay, this is the structure of data that is coming in. Uh, so I define this where, the structure of data that is 
coming from the source, you have to define that on the PSA, right? So when you say PSA, it means I have to define that on the data source. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and define that on my data source. Uh, let me show that to you. So I have <coughs> to go ahead and create a data source. So I go into my data sources and let me go into my file data sources. Let's say there's something called flat file. Open that. I have an application component for BW training, so I'll go ahead and create one data source from here. Create. ZDS underscore Q. And this is transaction data, so I click on transaction data and say continue. Well, ask me what is my description. Probably just copy paste this here. If you see, these fields are pretty much the same, or these tabs are pretty much the same for your mass data and your transaction data. So at the extraction, I'll have to mention what is the file that I'm trying to extract from. So I'll close this file. I see I'm going to go trans, so just click on it. I don't need the first row, so I'll just say ignore the first row. This is a CSV file, so my comma is the separator. Colon. My fields. So I go ahead and define the structure of my data source. The first one will be uh, Z customer one, customer number one. So I go ahead and define that. So if I say copy, we'll copy the structure of that. So I'll add a few more rows so that I can add more info objects to that. Z material number one. Say enter. Okay, so this is my mass data. The next thing will be my um, transaction data. So I'll say price. So Z price one. So when I press enter for Z price, and you find that you have a reference field currency that will be automatically added to the structure. So it brings that structure in. And then you have quantity. I also have something called Z revenue. All right, so let's say this is the structure that I'm defining. All right, and then <coughs> uh, <coughs> see whenever you're dealing with transaction data. Transaction data doesn't send you just numbers, all right? You will have a little bit of your basic mass data that is loaded. So it will say C1, M1, and then your transaction data, which is price, quantity, revenue. Now, over and above that, when you want to link it to your mass data to get the right result, and if you want to drill down a little further onto that, that's when your SID links will happen. So 
any which way your mass data is loaded for this cube, meaning the customer data is loaded. We have loaded that in the other one. I've loaded material data as well. I'll show that to you. <coughs> so once you define this is the structure of data that is coming in from my Excel file. Okay, so once I go and activate that uh, particular thing, I could have the <coughs> data source ready. I'm going to the preview tab. I can go and check the preview data. So I take a look at this data. <coughs> All right, so this is uh, the mass data, but the actual reference for this, uh, I will have to check if that is loaded. So uh, I could go into my info providers and I find that I have loaded data for my customer and material. I could right click on my material and say, uh, display data and data for material number M012 M20 I also have <coughs> my data for customer number all right and you will have the same number also in your transaction uh, file to which you're connecting c001 to c20 and m001 to m20 so uh, I have created my data source. I, I have not brought in, this is just a preview of data that it's linking with the file, but to actually bring the data from that file, you have to first, uh, your info cube is pretty much all by itself. Do not have, if I say display data flow, there's nothing much that it will flow, just an info cube created. But for you to have that flow, you would need to have uh, the info cube connected to the data source and that you will do it only through the connecting when you're creating transformations. So you'll have to go and mention what is the name of your data source. ZDS underscore cube one and you're connecting that through the flat file so we're going to define that and say continue if you see that the system has automatically proposed your transformation rules so you're connecting from uh, the different sources to uh, the cube structure <coughs> so you have data coming in and if you see price and uh, the currency Okay, both of them are going into the same info object here called price. All right. So in case over and above this, you want to go ahead and write some other rules. You can click on this is equal to and write any rule. If not, you go ahead and activate this. So it says that conversion type missing or invalid. So let's go into each of these. Uh, Thing. I don't want any conversion for right now, so
So we go into quantity. So there is something called as conversion here, so I don't need any conversion. So I'd say no conversion. Where is so the transfer values? Go and check if there are any issues. Where is form? Let's click on activate. So once you've activated, now you could go ahead and uh, right click on the cube and then say display data flow. And say continue. Okay, this is not refreshed yet. Alright, so you'd find that from the flat file to the data source to the, uh, through the transformation to the data target. Alright, so this is the flow that we have created. But how does data move from uh, the flat file into the uh, info cube or into the BW system first is through creation of an info package and that you would create on the data source. I click on the data source and say create info package. Extraction and processing just make only till the PSA there's my update of full load and then my schedule. So I click on the start button. We have data was requested, so you can go into the monitor and check for the data. The next thing is uh, data is still now there at the target level, I mean at the PSA level that has to move to the target. For that the only way of moving data is through the DTP from the PSA. So define your DTP, activate your DTP. That's a full load. I'll activate my DTP so that I can click on execute. Alright, so your data is loaded to your data target, so you can go in and take a look at the requests. So you find the request ID. This is the one I'm talking about, which is, will become a part of my primary key from the cube. So if I want to look at the content of the info cube, I can go in there and look at my fact table. Okay. So <clears throat> what would you see in my fact table? If I click on my fact table and say I want to see the data inside my fact table, if I click on execute, do I find any alphanumerics? system is automatically converted that to SIDs and MIDs and then it's storing it as numbers. The entire thing is showing up as numbers on which you will report. So if you're looking at the info cube content, we'll ask you to select <coughs> customer material. So if you want to see your SIDs values also, then you can select that. So these are the values that come up. For C0, so for customers, this is the SID numbers that you're getting. For material, you're getting these. For currency, you're getting these values. Your price, your quantity, and your revenue. All right. Wherever. When you connect it in the report, uh, the customer C001 will link to the actual mass data called C001 and you will find that 
uh, C001 has a description customer, uh, master, or customer one. So when you're uh, actually doing your report, so in case you don't want to see the ID, you want to see the description to make more uh, sense of it, you can go and define that to be uh, the customer, uh, or instead of the key, you can say you want to go and define the description part of it. <coughs> That will be the advantage that you can pull off uh, for using the uh, text part of uh, the customer. All right. So just to uh, briefly give you the steps for uh, the creation of the info cube. The first thing is uh, you'll have to go ahead and right click on your info area and say create info cube. That will be a standard info cube that you're creating and uh, it will ask you for, let me just show that to you while we go ahead and talk. So it'll ask you uh, to define any dimensions that you want and you'll have to, in case you want to create all in one dimension, you can go and create, let's say, one dimension, you need not name it. If you want to, you can leave the name as it is. Uh, and you can drag in the info objects into one dimension. Now, <clears throat> let's say we, I want to take a look at my dimension table also. So let's say I go slash OSC11, how do I look at the tables? So this there. So name of our cube that I see on this cube, so just put in an asterisk in the front that I see underscore cube, another asterisk at the end and say F4. You find all the different tables that are related to this cube. You have an E fact table, you have dimension unit, uh, you have you don't have a term dimension, you have a package dimension customer dimension and material dimension. So let's say I click on uh, the customer dimension just to see what is the value that you have in your customer dimension. So you'd find that it is linked with dimension ID linked with your SID of customer number one. All right, so you can go and click on that content and see that the system stores the dimension ID assigned with your customer ID. Okay, this is the SID table uh, data that you can get from customer and based on that your dimension table also is created. All right. So everywhere you'll find numbers and numbers. So we've seen that during our uh, class yesterday that your SID table consists majorly of numbers uh, that will convert your <coughs> uh, Info object, which is so. Where is my RSA one? So if I go in here and open this. So if I go into my customer number and go into my SID table slash BIC, so I'll find how the system actually saves those numbers. So I can click on the SID table for customer number one and find that C001, you have a value two that is stored. And this two will be the one that will always reference at your dimension table level, All right? For C001. Right. You can also define whether you should you want the system to pick these numbers or you can define the range of which you want the system to pick the uh, numbers also. We have that uh, facility as well. So yeah, coming back, once we define uh, the 
dimensions, then uh, we'll also define the key figures that we're using. And that will be uh, once we've done that. Okay, uh, for creating a cube, uh, one thing is mandatory. You should at least have one key figure that you define in your info cube. All right. Uh, so you have your master data. Along with that, you should have at least one uh, key figure that you define so that your basic data is your transaction data that you're trying to analyze in your info cube. So you need at least one measure or key figure that should be defined. So uh, you define one key figure. Then <coughs> uh, once you define your info cube, now that info cube has to uh, hold some data. And for you to hold that data of transaction, uh, you need to define a data source from where your data is coming and how uh, you would be mapping that data to your info cube. And that is through the data source. So you define a data source and you define a structure of how the data is coming from uh, the data source. So your data source will have the structure of the source system data that is coming in. So you have to go to your application component, define your data source there as a transaction data, and define the structure of data that is coming in from your Excel file. So once you define that, then to connect your data source to the info cube, you will need transformations. So you go ahead and define transformations as well. Then your actual flow is kind of ready, where you have uh, your flat file source and from there you will have your data source which is nothing but your PSA structure from the data source to connect to the data target you would have transformations and that's the entire flow but data movement has to happen from the source to the BW system through info package and from the PSA till uh, the data target through ETP. So with that flow you first go and create an info package and execute an info package. Uh, so when you execute an info package, data will move from your source uh, file, which is your CSV file, to your PSA structure. And from there, from PSA to your data target through the only one DTP. All right? So <coughs> in case you want to write any business rules, that will happen at your transformation level in case you want to schedule your object uh, as to how you want to pull the data, you schedule it both at the info package uh, level. Uh, let's say you want to schedule it for a delta. So all those options you will have that at the info package level. The DTP will be the one through which you will pick that request and push it to your uh, data target. All right. Any questions? Now, just now. Yes. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, this is the concept of uh, the info cube, how you would go ahead and use it. <coughs> I want you to go and practice this so that uh, we will be uh, handling <coughs> the DSOs in tomorrow's session. Uh, just to mention, uh, I'd be traveling from my hometown back to Hyderabad. So in case I might not be available, uh, if I reach there by time, then I will do the session. In case I'm not there by time, uh, I might not be able to handle the session tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, just just to let you know beforehand, uh, make sure that uh, in case you get an additional day tomorrow, uh, I will keep you posted. I will uh, Ravi will be sending you an email about uh, 
Yeah, we will be sending you an email about the status uh, 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 at least half an hour, one hour before. Uh, <coughs> Right. And uh, the other thing, uh, Simi is asking, how much of this information would you need for BPC? So, <clears throat> be it for BPC, BCS, whatever, or even normal, you will need to understand how you create an info queue uh, and how you would load data, how do you use a DSO. That information, basic information, is definitely necessary. Uh, for you to go ahead and design cubes, unless you're using business content cubes to activate them from uh, the business content and start using them directly. But even if you define them, you will have to understand Manual, uh, is, just one, uh, uh -huh. one, one, one small request. Uh, you know, going forward, uh, I mean, we have just covered what now four days. But going forward, uh, since we are on fast track, could you, uh, uh, you know, let us know uh, as a heads up, you know, in, in before the sessions, what you are going to cover for the next session, or perhaps until the end of the course, you know, tell us what day we are going to do what. That way. Uh, we will be uh, more uh, geared towards you know what if we have to do any this or if we have to complete any assignments or exercises so that just we follow asking. the next days uh, then that will just be just ask no, just asking so <clears throat> you will have to complete practicing whatever I teach in each class okay and I will teach it in a way that it is connected to your next class I might not be able to give you a schedule of each day what we are covering because some we are scheduling it to do it in two weeks, but which is again not a possibility. We might spill over into another three or four sessions extra. But uh, so I cannot specifically say this because we are doing uh, a little more of than what we usually do. Okay. So I am trying to push uh, more information into each session than what we do in two sessions or one and a half sessions. I try to push it into are uh, this thing. So I can't give you a specific thing. Every session is important. Every session is connected with the session that is previous to it. Alright, that's how I uh, do my training. And what I need to do, uh, you need to do from what we're doing is I need you to practice and come up with questions. In that way I know that you are practicing, you are understanding. If there's no questions asked from your side, I either understand that you know everything or you didn't understand anything from my previous class. Right? Uh, no, what, what, probably what I, I have you... been doing is to go through uh, the recorded okay. sessions. Mm -hmm. what, what, I, what I think, uh, what I am doing and I think most of them are doing is to go through the recorded sessions and let it out in detail. Uh, you know, so that's what has been quite helpful. But the idea of saying, you know, that if we know at least tomorrow's class what we are going to have, Mm -hmm. Then that gives us that much more, uh, you know, uh, comfort of okay, we are going to that some lineage or something. Okay, so let's say I am doing the, let's say I am doing DSO tomorrow. So what will you do with it? Uh, well, I can get some collateral uh, information as a heads up, right? I'll tell you what happens, uh, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. uh, one is what we do here in in the class, mm -hmm. but I can prepare myself. For example, if you did uh, the extraction today. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're going to do it tomorrow, and if I read about it today, mm -hmm. there are many things that may not be able to be covered in class because we have a very short span of time, hardly mm -hmm. one and a half hours or something. Mm -hmm. But then there are many, many things which I could cover up on my own mm -hmm. to ramp up to come up to speed, you know. And then the, your class becomes that much more meaningful for me. That was the only cool. idea. <coughs> yeah, cool. That's fine. Uh, the thing is, I can give you a schedule since we are. If it's the usual schedule, then uh, the br the breakdown is already there. But the only thing is, since we're doing, uh, and I go at a very slow pace where everybody is on that level of understanding. But I understand that you are you want to do it in a hurry and you want to do it a little quick than usual. So 
uh, at least still we're doing modeling, so just giving you a little hints. Uh, we're doing DSOs for tomorrow. Then we look at how do we combine a cube and a DSO uh, with multi providers. Then multi providers are more like unions where you connect uh, different objects, whichever has a link. And we look at uh, info sets where you are actually connecting only common data. All right. And then we'll see a path as to how you can load data from a DSO to an info queue. Then we'll look at info, uh, I mean, open hub destinations. That's what we'll be covering during uh, the <coughs> modeling part. All right. But once we do that, then we come to the actual part where we are extracting data from ECC. Till now, we've just laying foundations by using flat files. Then on, we'll start using actual data coming from ECC. So once you do that, uh, we talk about different method, methods of extracting data, all right, from ECC. Are we using uh, logistic extractions? Are we using generic extractions? Are we using business content extractors? So one session of understanding what each one is, then we start extracting data. Now once we start extracting data from there, we go ahead and uh, try to push data into these cubes that we create. So if you bring a data from there, what kind of object do you want to push it into? Do you want to push it through the DSO to the cube, or do you want to push it through the DSO to the cube to the info, I mean to the multi-provider? How do you want to do that? So then we talk about what are the different ways of uh, loading data, full loads, delta loads, initialization loads. So what are these? Then we try to talk about what are the different kinds of deltas that are available. Right, so when do we go for uh, delta, what kind of delta do we go for inventory jobs, what kind of data do we go for finance or general ledger, so we try to understand that. Then we, uh, once we understand, we talk about business content, so in case we want to have a very rapid implementation, how do we use business content for our uh, advantage. Once that is done, then we move to reporting section. All right, and apart from this, whenever there is an uh, possibility, I'd be talking about performance enhancement, all right? That's how our uh, training will follow. But if you want it as a timetable as to where and when we're doing, I will try to give that to you, all right? Any questions, guys? Manuel, what is the uh, uh, business planning and consolidation. Now there are a few modules that are connected to uh, BW, which will again this is like uh, a big platform where you have BPC, BPS, and data coming in from other modules. Uh, your actual uh, handling of data will happen in BW, and these are modules from where you bring in data. VPS, VPC, I think, has uh, to have a, a sandwich between the finance functional side and the BW. So <clears throat> you will be pushing data into here, and then uh, you'll be accessing that data through the BW system. If I'm right, Simi? Okay, so one more uh, <coughs> suggestion. Mm -hmm. Tell me, sir. Yeah, but tomorrow, I mean, uh, can we change the schedule where you would be more comfortable for having a class? Um, I don't know exactly. So, see, the <laughs> uh, if it was like the U.S. where I had a specific time when I had reached that, it will be fine. I'm supposed to reach there by... 4.30 or 5 in the morning, uh, but I wish I could uh, exactly at that time. In case it gets delayed, then I don't know. So that's the reason why I'm telling whether uh, I would be able to make it or no. Yeah, in this case, maybe I mean, we can we schedule something like uh, 6.30 your time or 7 your time, that way we are sure that we are going to have a class. Uh, I think I try to because from 5 to 6.30 my Indian standard time, I do your batch at 6.30 to 8, I do another BI batch and 8 to eight to 10, I do a HANA batch. So 
I am stacked with these. So I don't know. I am telling the same thing to all these three batches because I am not sure. On days it reaches on time. On days it takes two to three hours of delay. So in which I cannot do any of those batches. So I am just telling them that probably I might not be able to do a session tomorrow. All right. So yeah, the reason I am asking is if we know that we don't have a class, we, we can schedule something else or go somewhere else instead of just right. waiting or here. Okay, cool. Then uh, if you guys want to do that, uh, take an off tomorrow, uh, plan your day accordingly, and then uh, we'll meet day after on Monday. Is that okay? Okay for me. All right. All right. So, uh, I mean, when I say you can take a break. Emmanuel, we, Emmanuel, we, we have a HANA class from Monday. So that's going to be, and that starts at 9. Mm -hmm. So the moment we finish uh, the BI one with you, you have to go on to some other class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kalyan told me about that. Yeah. So that was the only reason the idea was to you know complete as much, at least until reporting you know by this uh, this weekend. Mm -hmm. mm, so I, I told him if you could let us know if you could let us know because I don't know whether. Uh, uh, to my knowledge, I think Sheikh and myself and Chinna are in in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So if you can, let all us of them know. are in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you can let us know uh, that too on the Eastern EST, if you could let us know by uh, say uh, latest whatever time. I mean, say if you shoot a mail at around 10 p.m. or something, we come to know of it in the morning. Uh, because by that time I think you would so, have got a ticket or you know something like that. No, no. The only thing that I'm saying is take an off for tomorrow. We're meeting again the same way that we do uh, from uh, Monday onwards. I'm just giving you an off only on Sunday. So because I'm not sure about what time I'd reach. Okay. So from Monday it will be the same. We do a session from uh, your 7.30 to 9 and then you could do your HANA session after that. All right. The next weekend, the next Saturday and Sunday, we'll do extended sessions so that it doesn't clash with your HANA sessions. For either to do it in the mornings for you or a little late in the evenings. So we'll try to go ahead and uh, check that. All right. Okay, thank you, Manuel. We'll see you on Monday. Take care. Yep. Take care, guys. Bye for now. Thanks, Sheikh. Bye. <coughs> the organizer has ended the session, and this call will be disconnected.